We are going to walk through every single book of the Bible on Wednesday nights, all right? Every Wednesday night, you will get a new book of the Bible, and whoever the speaker is has one week to give you an overview of that book of the Bible. Now, they will not give you everything. Tonight, we're going to start on the book of Genesis, and I can go ahead and let you know, you will not get everything. In fact, you won't even get a quarter of the book of Genesis, okay? But every single... Uh, person who stands up there has one goal in mind. I'll, I'll get the, I'll, I'll get there in just a second. Has one goal in mind, okay? And this is why we called it the Emmaus Road. Some of you may be familiar with the story or with the uh, passage in Scripture where after Jesus had been crucified, after He rose from the grave, there are two of His followers walking on a road to Emmaus. And Jesus, the resurrected Christ, meets with them. And he walks beside them, but they don't recognize him because let's be honest, who expects to be talking to a dead man that they've just known was crucified three days previously? They walk all along with him and they say to this person they think is a stranger, have you not heard that Jesus was killed? We thought he was going to be the Christ. And on those seven miles that they walked to Emmaus, it says that Jesus, this is Luke 24, 27, it's at the bottom of your study guide. Jesus, in beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. We're calling it Emmaus Road because our goal is to take every book of the Bible, all 66 books of the Bible, and our goal is to show you Christ in every book of the Bible. And believe me when I say he is dripping all over the text. He is from every book. He is in every single story. And so just to give you a big picture of the Bible, we are, we're, we're, we've got a Western mindset. We've got an American mindset. We think of things in terms of a line, beginning, middle, and end. That's how we think of them, okay? But this is not a Western book. This is an Eastern book, okay? It was written somewhere far, far away from here and in a time and in a writing style that's very different. And the way that they write is this. There is one central core idea. One core idea. And they have all these stories around the core idea. And every single story points to the central idea. That is the way the Bible is written. It's not written in a linear order, even though we kind of have it in a linear order, starting with Genesis and ending in Revelation. There is a bit of a line to it. That's not how it was written originally. It's written to communicate one central idea, and that one central idea is Christ. Does that make sense, guys? So, you are going to jump in with me, and I don't have a whole lot of time. And I'm feeling the pressure, I'm feeling the crunch of what are we going to do with our time to make the most of our study in Genesis. So you guys are going to need to open up to Genesis, all right? Open it up to Genesis. What's the first story in the Bible? What's the first story? First story. What is it? Creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. For the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. But the Spirit of God was hovering over those waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God creates everything through His breath, through His speaking. He creates everything. Except for people. People are different. It says that people He takes from the dust of the ground, He forms them. He forms them. There's something different about people. There's a relationship aspect that he has with people. There's an intimacy that he has with people. And you see it from the very beginning when he forms them from the dust, all right? But creation is not all that happens in Genesis. In fact, it's the very first part of Genesis, and it's an amazing part of Genesis, but everything launches from there. And I want to let you know that, number one on your study guide, the book of Genesis perfectly establishes the reason for and the design of the gospel. The book of Genesis perfectly establishes the reason for 
and the design of the gospel. Remember what I told you. Remember what I told you. There is one central theme, and every book of the Bible is pointing to that one central theme. Genesis is pointing to the gospel, and it perfectly sets it up. Perfectly sets it up. After God creates everything, you know the story. You know the story. After He creates everything, He places Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And there are two trees. One is the tree of life and the other is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God says, do not eat of the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, lest ye die. And you guys know what happens, right? What happens? What happens? Yeah, the serpent tempts Eve and Adam, and they eat of the fruit. Sin enters the world. A lot of times we call that the fall. But I think a more appropriate word would be the rebellion. Because it's the first time you see in all of Scripture where they not only fall into sin, but they openly reach out their hands and actively rebel by taking the fruit to eat of it. So, the reason, number two, the reason for the gospel is rebellion and death. We've got some Bible passages that we're going to open up to. I will read Genesis 3, 1 through 6. When we want to take Psalm 51, 4, Logan, who wants Romans 8, 5 through 8, Casey. All right? Let me read to you, let me read to you the fall or the rebellion when it first started. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. And in verse 5, I'll, I'll continue there. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Rebellion, starting off in the garden, trusting the serpent's words rather than the words of God, reaching out, taking the fruit and eating it, knowing that they were acting rebelliously they were acting against the command of God. It's not just that we see that not just this sin, but every single sin that's ever committed is an open rebellion against God. Psalm 51.4. Who had that? Understand, guys, that there are plenty of people I have done wrong against, all right? Plenty of people I could say that I have done wrong things against, but we know from the Scriptures that every single sin ultimately and truly is against one, and that one is God and God alone. Romans 8, 5 through 8. So understand, guys, understand our rebellion is against God. It's against Him alone. But God made a way for us to be saved from that. And we see it in Genesis. Right after the fall, God shows up in the garden. What did Adam and Eve do? Y'all know? What did they do? They tried to hide, all right, which it doesn't work. If you, have you ever, okay, 
to the parents in the room, they will understand this completely. All right, there are several times when my children were growing up and they would go and play hide and seek. And they would hide in the most obvious place in the world. And I knew exactly where they were. But I would still pretend like I couldn't find them. If we take it a step further, there were times where my little boy, in particular, did very wrong things. And he went to go hide from his dad. Why? Because wrath was coming. All right? And he would hide in the most obvious place in the world. But when I would walk into the room, rather than going and digging him out from the closet or digging him out from underneath his bed, I would walk in there and I'd say, where are you? Knowing full well where he was. God shows up in the garden says, where are you? Adam and Eve come out. They pass blame. They point fingers all day. But the thing I want to bring up is this. Though they had rebelled, though the punishment was laid out that death was the only thing that was to come from their rebellion, I want to show you in Genesis 3, 14 through 19, if you want to read along, it's on the study guide. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And you guys have heard us read this countless times before. You're going to hear it countless times in the future. Here is the first mention of the gospel in the Bible. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your, multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam... He said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust and to dust you shall return. Death is coming. Death will happen. But there's a delay. Why is there a delay? Because God offers hope. The first glimpse, the first look at hope. There will be someone born from the woman and He will bruise the serpent's head. In other words, He will put under His foot the work of the serpent and you shall bruise his heel. In the process of crushing that serpent, he's going to be hurt. But Adam and Eve don't die immediately. They don't immediately just bite it. They deserve it, but they don't immediately go down. And so, take your minds... And imagine that you're reading this for the first time. And when you read this for the first time, you stop and you say, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What happened to what God said? What, I understand He's, he's going to provide some sort of means for them to be saved, but, but are they going to have to stay forever in this rebellious state? Are they going to have to live like that for all of eternity? That's removed. That's taken off the table. Because God does kick them out of the garden. He says that lest he, this is in verse 22 of chapter 3, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. In other words, God said, because of the sin that they are in, I will not leave them to live forever in their sin. I will send someone. He will undo the sin that has been carried out. But they must first be removed from the garden 
because death is their curse for sin. This is a gracious thing. Adam and Eve are not going to live forever in rebellion. There will be a way for salvation. Genesis sums up, this is number three, the reason we need the gospel in three words. And he died. And he died. Let me walk you through it. It's not the next story. The next story, by the way, is Cain and Abel. You guys know that story, right? Cain rises up and kills his brother Abel. So you just see this death and you see this murder and you see this wicked sort of generation. You keep hoping, you keep thinking as you're reading this, well, maybe Cain is going to be the one who bruises the head of the serpent, but he gets his heel broken. And then maybe it's Abel, but of course that story shows that no, that's not the case. So then you get to chapter 5, and in chapter 5 you start to see Adam's descendants. All right, and so, okay, we've got a list of names here. Maybe one of these, maybe one of these is that one who will rise up and will crush the head of the serpent. So in chapter 5, let me just read the first uh, five verses. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female he created them, and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years. He had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days that Adam lived were 930 years. There it is in those three words. And he died. Someone read verse 8 for me. Who wants to read verse 8? Just do it. Just, we just, when you get to it, start reading it if I call it out. So all the days of Seth were 912 years. And he died. There's those th- same three words of the curse, the reason that we need the gospel, those same three words. What about verse 11? And he died. The same three words. Verse 14. And he died. There he is, verse 17. So Mahalel's life lasted 895 years and he died. He died. Verse 20. That's all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. There we have it, guys. We're not going to keep reading it on, but understand, we see the curse over and over and over again, those same three terrible words, and he died, and he died, and he died. And we start to feel, if you're reading this for the first time, you start to feel the gravity of it. You start to feel the weight of this rebellion. You start to feel the weight of this death. And you start sitting there and thinking, who is it? Who's supposed to be coming along that's going to crush the serpent? It's none of these people. All these people have that and he died on their head just like Adam. Who is it? But then hope comes along. Number four in the study guide. Hope to live is given in three very different words. And those words are walked with God. Let me read to you Genesis, that's not supposed to be 3, I'm part, that's supposed to be chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. It said, When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God. Those same three words. And he was not, for God took him. All of a sudden, you've got this, these three different words, walked with God, and because Enoch walked with God and he died was not part of his story. And he died is not his end. So, walked with God, what is that? What is this walk with God? It gives us nothing. It just says He walked with God. And then He was not, for God took Him. And so, well, maybe that fixed it. Maybe it was Enoch 
Maybe he's the one who did it. But if you look at verse 27, thus all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. You look at verse 31, thus all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. He was not the serpent crusher. Though he walked with God, he didn't do it for anybody else. What is this walked with God? Well, the next time, the very next time we see those three words, walked with God, is in the very next chapter. And maybe this will give us a clue as to what walked with God is. Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. God. Okay, there's someone else who walked with God, but what is it? What is walked with God? I don't understand what this is. Put yourself in like the mindset that you're reading it for the first time. It would be driving you crazy if you didn't know the end of the story. What is it? And so you read through it and God gives very specific instructions to Noah. He uh, he says, this is how you are to make it. Talking about the ark. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits. Its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark. I'm not going to read all this, but when we get to verse 22, maybe there, maybe, maybe that's the clue we need. Maybe that's the clue we need. Verse 22, Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. <sighs> maybe that's it. Maybe... Maybe walked with God. Maybe it's, it's instead of rebelling against God, maybe it's just obeying God. Maybe, that, maybe obedience trumps rebellion. Maybe that's it. And so you get the mindset, okay, okay, I've got this walked with God thing. I've got it. It's just that I've got to be obedient. I've just got to do the things that are right. I'm supposed to do what God says. They did what He said not to do. I need to do what He says to do. Okay, maybe that's it. And then you keep reading and you're like, oh, there's a flood that comes. Okay, and Noah and his family survived. Yes, he walked with God. He obeyed God. That's it. Walked with God, being obedient. That's all it is. Okay, I can just obey. I can just do what he says. And then I'm good. Until you get to chapter 9. Someone read verses 28 and 29. And he died. And all of a sudden, the hope, the hope that you were holding on to so much, and he died, wasn't a part of Enoch because he walked with God. Noah walked with God and he didn't die in the flood. And so you sit there and you're like, okay, 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 that's it. But then, and he died is still the end of his story. And all of your hopes in this walking with God, meaning obedience, comes crashing down. Now, I know we know the end of the story. I know we understand the central idea that this is pointing to. But go in your mind to that place, that first time that you read it, and just feel the devastation of the first time reader having that crumble to the ground. And you realize a very grim thing. Number five on the study guide. We cannot rely on our own obedience. We cannot rely on our own obedience. Someone read Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. Someone get it. I, I just, I got it. I'll get you on the next one. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. This is Jesus talking, by the way. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus himself, looking out at this crowd, says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Guys, let me just give you just a brief understanding of who the Pharisees were. Like they, 
they were like the ultimate religious people. They were the ultimate like God followers. They were the ones who were seen like being the prestigious, like in line with the laws of God. There was not a law that they didn't try to follow. In fact, they invented laws to follow the laws of God even more closely. And in doing that, they actually failed in their following. And Jesus says, guys, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And everyone hearing that at that moment, again, their hopes would have just crumbled. Why? Because there's no one who obeys better than the Pharisees. There's no one who follows God closer than the Pharisees. And you're telling me that I've got to have righteousness that exceeds that? And just like for the first time reader in Genesis, their hopes would have crumbled in anything that they could do. And it lies just a mass, a heap on the ground. So where do we look? We have to look back not to the strength of man because so far the strength of man has only rebelled against God and the strength of man has only failed. So where do we have to look back? We have to look back to the very first promise of God, the first look at the Gospel. And we learn, number six, that God will choose to save people because of His grace. Because of His grace. Some of you should already know these verses. Shall I have them committed to memory? Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own. Not your own doing, not yourselves. If you memorize it earlier in life. Not yourselves. It is the... It is, the, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may perish. God will choose to save people because of His grace. In other words, He is not looking for Adam to all of a sudden do more works of obedience to trump his rebellion. He's not looking for for Noah to obey Him more than he disobeys. And that's it. He's not looking to you to do that. There's this weird mindset that God looks at our lives and He has balance scales and He puts all the bad on one side and all the good on the other. And if the good outweighs the bad, well then, hallelujah, you're saved. But that's not the way the Bible shows us. Rather, it shows us that we have rebelled against God and there is no good that we have ever committed on our own. Our righteousness does not exceed that of the Pharisees and so the scale is always tipped against us. It shows our rebellion and it shows our desperate need for God's grace because we cannot achieve this on our own. So flipping through, we get to Genesis 12. We're getting close to the end. I won't make it all the way to chapter 50. In chapter 12, number 7 on your outline, God chose Abraham. Actually, I'm going to back up a little bit. We're gonna, I want someone to read Genesis 12, 1 through 3, but I'm going to pick up a few verses before that and then I'll tell them to. Uh, did, did you say, you, I'll let you read Genesis 12, 1 through 3, but let me back up a little bit. Remember, all this while you're looking for what is this walked with God? Okay, it's not obedience. I can't do that on my own. So I've got to be looking for this child, this person who's going to be born, who's going to crush the head of the serpent. I'm looking for someone to do something for me because I can't do it on my own. And you're desperately reading through Genesis looking for that someone. And when you get to verse 11... I'll start at verse 27. Now, these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram. By the way, Abram's name is later changed to Abraham. Fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot. Haran, or Haran, died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. 
And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. The name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren. She had no child. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Again, you're looking who is going to be the one, who's going to be the one to stand up and to do it. And when you read through this, you kind of see, okay, well, maybe it's going to be Terah. No, it's not going to be Terah because he dies. Maybe it's going to be... Uh, uh, Haran or Haran, no, he, he dies. And you're looking for, maybe it's going to be Abram. No, it can't be Abram because he can't have any other children. Uh, his wife's barren. Uh, there's nothing he can do for God. What about Nahor? Uh, I don't think that's it either. You're reading through it, and then the most unlikely thing happens. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Read it for us. And the reader, all of a sudden, there's another moment where you just stop. Because you think, whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I've been looking for the one to come and to do something great. And you mean to tell me that God is going to choose a guy who can do nothing for him? He can't even have a child with his wife. He can't even do the most basic thing that families are called to do. The first commandment given to Adam and Eve in the garden is be fruitful and multiply. Abram can't even do that. And God chooses this guy? What an illustration of God's grace. What an example of how God doesn't look to the outward appearance. He doesn't look at the way that we see. Rather, He looks to the heart. The heart that He will turn from a heart of stone into a heart of flesh. And you see God's grace abounding right here. And just pouring out. And all of a sudden you start to get it. Okay, if we're going to have anything happen for us, if anything good is going to come out of this, if there's ever going to be a blessing towards people, it's got to be God and God alone who chooses. It's got to be His power and His ability, not mine. It's got to be what He can accomplish, not what I can do with the strength of my hands. And for the first time reader, it hits you like a freight train. And that's why everyone, even to the time that uh, when we see Jesus coming along, and, and even to the Jewish people today, they still put so much stock in Abraham because they sit there and like, look how great Abraham was. Look how great he was. And you kind of get there and you think, do, do, you, do you not understand? You're missing the point. It's not about how great Abraham was. It's about how wonderful God is. That even the lowliest, even the weakest was chosen to be saved. We're going to end in chapter 15. Let me set this up for you real quick. Abram is promised a child. He's promised a land to live in. And years and years and years pass. And still no child. Still no land to live in. And God starts, or excuse me, Abram starts to wonder, did I really hear God right? Did he, did he really choose me? He starts to think about himself. He starts to think about what he can do. And can he really have chosen me? By the way, 
You don't have to read it. Um, you don't have to, to see in it where it is. But immediately after God tells him that he's going to call him, Abram sins in a terrible way. He goes into Egypt and he tells Pharaoh, he says, hey, because he knew his wife was beautiful, he said, that's, that's, that's not my wife, that's my sister. And he does that because he didn't want anyone to, to get after him or kill him for his wife. So all kinds of horrible things start happening. Almost putting the nail in the coffin that, yeah, it's not about Abram, it's about God. By the time, by the time we get to chapter 15, verse 1, After these things the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield, your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless in the air of my house. It was Eliezer of Damascus. I don't have a child. I don't know what's going on, God. How do I know? And so God says, I'm going to show you how you can know. And He institutes a covenant with Abram right then and there. And He says this. He says you need to take... uh, he gives him instructions. He says to take uh, a female goat. Excuse me. First he says take a heifer three years old, cut it in half, drag the bodies apart. Take a goat, cut it in half, drag the bodies apart. Kill a turtle dove, a young pigeon, put them at the head of it. Also, uh, he's to kill a ram. And... Drape it apart. So you've got this, almost this red carpet of blood. Now the reason for that is there was a covenant that was made a long time ago. It was called the, uh, the covenant of the suzerain king or suzerain king. All right? A great high king would stand at the forefront and said, I will protect you. I will take care of you. I will be your king. You will be my servant. And you will live under my uh, protection all the days of your life. And the lesser servant, the lesser king, would say, yes, I want to do that. And he would say, then walk across the blood path. And they would walk across the blood path. And as they were walking across the blood path, the statement would be said, you will serve me, you will be obedient to me, you will follow my commands, you will do only what I say, you will never stray from what I say. And if you do stray from what I have commanded you, then what has happened to these animals will be the curse upon your head. In other words... You follow exactly in obedience to that great king or you die like those animals. Abram sets up the covenant and then he starts to be terrified. Why does he start to be terrified? Because he recognizes if he walks across that path, there is no way he stays obedient. There's no way he can do it on his own. There's no way he has the strength to do it. And so he starts to be terrified. He starts to be scared out of his mind. Look at verse 17 of chapter 15. When the sun had gone down, it was dark. Behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadamites. Uh, I'm just going to stop right there because we don't need all the ites. Just understand what happens there. Understand there. You have a smoking pot and a flaming torch go in between them. What is the purpose of that? That is a symbol of God Almighty Himself walking that bloodline. How do I know that? Because later on in the book of Exodus, we know that God is a cloud by day and fire by night. Here we have smoke and we have fire. God Himself walks down there. And you need to know the last point God walked with God in order that we could be saved. 
God looks at Abram and says, I know you cannot fulfill the commandments. I know you cannot keep in obedience with me. I know you have no strength. I know you have no ability in your own doing. You cannot obey me perfectly. But God can obey God perfectly, and He's the only one who can. God's Son can obey Him perfectly, and He's the only one who does. And God Himself says, I will walk that path with you, and I will keep obedience for you. Abram, I will be obedient on your behalf, Abram. And if you break the commands, if you break my obedience, if you are disobedient, then the curse that is on these animals won't fall upon you, Abram. It will fall upon me. If you fail in following the commands, the curse will fall upon God Himself. God is the only one who could walk in righteousness. God is the only one who could walk with God to fulfill the righteousness and the obedience that we need. And he, because Abram sins, immediately after, in chapter 16, he immediately fails. And we immediately fail in our sin. God himself took that covenant. And because of our sin, Jesus came. He was the one born of the woman. He was the one who would crush the head of the serpent. But His heel was bruised because Jesus died. Not because of something evil He had done. Not because of rebellion He had committed. But because we have committed rebellion. And just like how in that promise of Abraham... If you fail to follow my commandments, the curse will not fall upon Abram. The curse fell upon God Himself, the one who walked that bloodline. There is so many more instances in Genesis where you see the Gospel. So many more. But for our time tonight, I wanted to point it out to you with this very fast walkthrough. And I hope that you understand the book of Genesis a little bit more. I hope that you see how Genesis is pointing to the main idea, the reality of the Gospel, that Jesus Christ came. He lived a perfect, sinless life, full obedience. He died a sinner's death. He rose three days later. And we can have salvation because of God's grace through faith in Christ. We pray for us. And you're going to have the opportunity to sing to the one who's provided salvation. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we do love you and we praise you. And we thank you for the blessings that you give us. We thank you for the opportunity we have to look at your at your word, one book at a time, and to see the central idea, the theme of the gospel clearly in every book. I pray for the students as we go through this study that you would give them minds to understand. I pray for the teachers as they stand up to preach your word that, Father, you would give them clarity to communicate your gospel. And, Father, I ask that the central idea of your son, Jesus, would be clearly heard and understood through this entire series. And it's in your son's name we ask these things and for his sake. Amen.